everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me. But let's go over here to math to Revelation chapter 8. Because the first the four horsemen of the apocalypse or the first four seals correspond with what Yeshua said was going to happen there in Matthew 24. And we'll just tag this base real quickly. Um, let's see here. The chronology of Revelation is clear. The first seven seals occur between Revelation 6, verse 1, and 8, verse 5. And then the seven trumpets sound. Revelation 8, verse 6 through 11, 19. There is debate whether any of these have yet occurred. It is my opinion that only the first five seals of Revelation 6, 11 have transpired to date. So, the first five seals. Um, the first one is the white horse. What does that mean? I, I tend to think that that's the spread of Islam, uh, which is the second largest religion in the world and is the biggest Antichrist religion and fits the literal definition of the spirit of Antichrist as John reveals it in um, first John chapter, uh, for the first and third, I think it's third epistle of John where he talks about uh, Antichrist. And Islam fits perfectly the criteria. I'm not saying, you know, he said there's many antichrists, but Islam was the counterfeit religion that came up against Christianity and has been at war with Christianity ever since. And then we see wars of the red horse. That's war. That's been going on for 2,000 years. Famines. That's the black horse. That's been going on. And then we have... Um, Plagues and pestilence, oh, well, famines and, and brought on by economic issues. Um, and then we have the fourth seal, which is the, the, the pale horse. That's plagues and pestilence. And that corresponds with Matthew 24, verse 7. So the first horse corresponds with Matthew 24, 4, false religions. The uh, wars, that's Matthew 24, 6. Famines, that's Matthew 24, 7. And that's been, these things have been going on for 2,000 years. And then we see uh, pestilence, that's Matthew 24, 7. And then uh, the martyrdom of the saints, that's Matthew 24, verse 9. So the sixth seal, that's in uh, Revelation 12, uh, uh, 6, verse 12. And Yeshua talks about this in Matthew 24, 29. Uh, great earthquakes, the sun became black, and so forth and so on. So... Um, this this has this has not really happened yet. I said it had, but that's kind of the sign of his coming. Um, let's see. Hang on, let me go back here to Matthew twenty four. Um, oh yeah, it says immediately. Yeah, after the, so you know, some of this hasn't happened yet, but would definitely the four first four seals have happened. And uh, let's see, let me go back to my notes here so I don't get uh, too waylaid. Um, okay, so we are on the edge of waiting for the seventh, or the fourth, the fifth seal to, to begin to um, uh, be manifested. So... Here we see a one-to-one -one correlation, and um, but his return has not happened. And he mentions here, the, for the great day of his wrath has come in verse 17. So we see that the great, the tribulation and the great tribulation are not the wrath of Elohim. So the wrath of Elohim is what follows the trumpets and the bold judgments. Okay? So, um, 
Now, let's consider this. The Bible is very clear. The saints will not experience the wrath of Elohim. Yes, they go through tribulation. Yes, they will go through the great tribulation, but not the wrath. So 1, Corinthians, or 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, uh, he talks about who he delivers from the wrath to come. Uh, verse 10 says, And to wait for his, the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, and even Yeshua who delivers us from the wrath to come. The wrath of Elohim, why, why would he let the saints experience that? They've already passed from judgment into life. They've already been delivered from his wrath. They are now his children. They don't need to come under that wrath. Do we need refinement? Yes, we're not ready to meet Yeshua yet. We need to go through tribulation. We need to get our garments washed and all that. But we don't need to go through his anger. Why would he be angry with us? Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then 5 verse 8, For Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our, our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And then let's go to uh, uh, Luke 21, verse 36. Now, Luke 21 is the uh, uh, corollary to Matthew 24. It's Luke's version of the, uh, of the Olivet Prophecy. Luke 21, 36. It says here, the, uh, Watch... Therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So I, I do not believe, uh, I, you know, we're going to go through the wrath. Tribulation, great tribulation, yes, but not wrath. There's also, oh, there's also Revelation 3, verse 10. Let's go there real fast. Revelation 3, verse 10. And this is to the uh, church, uh, the saints in, Laod uh, in uh, Philadelphia. Um, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So he's going to protect his people. We're going to go through some things, but we're not appointed to wrath. The scripture indicates that the saints will be supernaturally protected from the wrath of Elohim. This can occur in one of several ways. The book of Revelation reveals that in the end times, Elohim will place a seal on the forwards of his saints to protect them from various judgments that will occur, both leading up to um, his period of wrath and during it. Revelation 7 verse 3, 9 verse 14, and 14 verse 1. I'm not going to turn there. You can, you can um, go there yourself. Additionally, during the first half of Yovah's wrath, he says he will protect some of his people in the wilderness of the three and a half years, Revelation 12, 14. Finally, he will deliver his people out of this earth entirely via the catching away of the saints to meet Yeshua in the air at the first resurrection at the seventh trumpet. But before the second half of the wrath of Elohim, which are the bold judgments of Revelation 15 and 16. So you say, well, Nathan, where are you getting that from? I mean, this is just kind of like, you know, you're just picking this out of the air. And, and so many years ago, Yah showed me about Noah. About Noah. And so remember, he says back here in Matthew 24, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming <clears throat> of the Son of Man. Verse uh, 24, 38, Matthew 24, 38. For, uh, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as, in the, um, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be coming the Son of Man. And that's, then he goes into what we already read. There will be two people you know, grinding at the mill or working in the field and one will be taken. So yes, there will be tough times, but life will continue. People will still be marrying and, 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 and having babies and going to work. Yeah, it may be really tough. There may be you know, the mark of the beast system, but people will still be living and doing the things that people do. So now let's take a look at Noah. And this is something that was very exciting to me when I read about this. And uh, well, I, I read about it by reading Noah. I didn't get this from anybody, but I believe that this confirms what Yeshua was saying. So when I read this many years ago, that you know, it's it's going to be like Noah in those days. So I went back and I studied the time frames of Noah's experiences with the flood. So 
Noah was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. Genesis 6, verse 3, and then it calls him a preacher of righteousness. I forget, that's in the New Testament, uh, in one of the epistles. He no doubt endured the mockery and persecution. There's your persecution period, folks, of those who did not believe his message about a coming flood and the need for an ark of safety when gen generation had not ex had experienced neither rain nor floods. Hebrews 11, 7 and 2 Peter 2, verse 5. In Genesis 7, verse 4, we learn that Yovah allowed Moses to experience seven more days of persecution before the rains of divine judgment came up, um, before the rains of, before the uh, rains of divine judgment um, came upon the earth. Only after that did Yovah shut up Noah in the ark of safety, Genesis 7:16. Remember, it says Yovah shut the ark. It doesn't say Noah. Yehovah shut them up in there. Divine, it was a divine thing. After which the ark was, quote, lifted up above the earth, end quote. That's what it says there, Gen Genesis 7, 17. What can we learn from this flood scenario that will help us to understand the order of end time events as it relates to the saints? Well, Yeshua teaches that in the end times, just prior to the second coming, life on the earth will be continuing as usual, as we just read in Matthew 24. He also teaches that his saints will go through tribulation on this earth, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 28, as well as great tribulation or megatholipsis, verse 21. Only after the great tribulation, only after the great tribulation, Matthew 29 through 24, 29 through 31. Will they be lifted up above the earth to meet him in the air? As Noah was lifted up above the earth, riding over the top of the waves, the storms and all the turbulence that was going on on this earth, he was raised up above that. Similarly, Scripture reveals that Noah endured another seven days is this the seven years, prophetic seven years of Daniel's prophecy? I don't know. Of the last week, I don't know. Maybe. But no endured another seven days of tribulation before the wrath of Elohim was poured out upon the wicked inhabitants of the earth in the form of the great flood. This seems to speak prophetically of a seven-year great tribulation period that the saints will go through before the uh, wrath of Elohim is poured out on the earth. Remember um, in Revelation 11, 15 through 18, this is where the seventh trump is sounded and rewards are given. Um, well, it talks about the wrath of Elohim being poured out and then the resurrection of the saints at the sound of the seventh trumpet being lifted out of the what I consider to be the second half of the wrath of Elohim. And this is at the seventh trumpet. And the chapters 15 and 16 of the book of Revelation um, are the seven last plagues or the seven bold judgments of, uh, uh, of Yehovah's wrath. And these are called the wrath of Elohim. We, if we turn to Revelation 15 and 16, numerous places. Okay, we already read in in, in, about in the fifth seal, it talks about the wrath of Elohim has come. And then we read in Revelation 11, it talks about his, his wrath. Is, is still, there's more of his wrath to come. And, 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 and then in Revelation 15 and 16, the wrath, verse 1, the wrath of Elohim is complete. In other words, this is the completion of the wrath of Elohim. It's already been going on. Now he's going to complete it. He's really going to, he's really going to, to, to turn up the heat. The wrath of Elohim is complete. And then he talks about the seven last plagues. Verse 16, verse 1. The wrath of Elohim. Go, go, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of Elohim on the earth. And then we see, it's mentioned like five or six times. 
Um, we're, we're in chapter 16. The fierceness of his wrath. Uh, 16 verse 19. So this is the wrath of Elohim. And then it culminates in chapter 17 and 18 especially with 18, with the destruction of the New World Order, Babylon the Great. Sorry, George Soros. Sorry, Bill Gates. Sorry, Baron de Rothschild. Sorry, Rockefeller. Sorry, um, um, Klaus Schwab. Sorry, all of these guys. All you bankers. Sorry, all of you people. You don't win. Sorry, Satan, the devil and all of your human instruments on this earth, you do not win. You were defeated 2,000 years ago, and this is your death throes. You are desperate, and you're going to lose. And so, i got to make a note here, because sometimes when I'm going over these things, Revelation is given to me, and I did not write them down when I was or didn't learn about it. Yeah. Revelation 15, verse 1. I need to go back. I had not seen in Revelation 15, 1, that the wrath of Elohim is complete. This confirms that the seven, in my mind, there's a seven... The seven trumpets are the beginning of the wrath, which I have been teaching. But this is another confirmation. And that the seven bowl judgments are the completion of the wrath. In fact, I'm going to look up that word. Is that the, is that the word plurao? I bet it is. Or, or cognate there. I'm going to look it up on my e-sword right now. Hold on, guys. This is life happening in, in real time. Revelation... Um, 15, verse 1. Teleo. Oh, that's even better. Teleo. It means the completeness or the fullness or the end goal. So um, that's what teleo means. It means to complete or to conclude or, you know, the... The end, end goal of something. So the wrath has already been going on for three and a half years. Uh, and maybe even before that. Anyway, he, it's being completed during the bold judgment. And for the very last period, the saints are taken out of the picture at that time. And go up to meet Yeshua in the air. Now, as I mentioned earlier, tribulation is... In Greek, Koine Greek is the Greek is the word Philipsis. Great tribulation is Philipsis. Wrath are two words in the Greek. Thumos, T H U M O S, and Orge, or O R G E Y, Orge. They both mean the same thing. And they are different than tribulation. Um, orge. Um, let's see, do I define them? <coughs> Pardon me, let me drink a water. Um, anyway, they are completely different words and different concepts. Persecution means persecution, and wrath literally means, well, look it up here. I got, I got my Bible program. It means... Fierceness, indignation, and wrath. And orge means, that's thumos. And orge means the same thing. Very different than persecution. Persecution and tribulation is what Satan is pouring out upon the people of Elohim. Or some people call that the wrath of Satan. The wrath of Elohim is what he is pouring out upon the world those who do not know him, those who do not, you know, unrepentant rebels. <clears throat> so anyway, and not upon his people. Okay? So let's now talk about, oh, let's, okay, we're back to Noah. 
So Noah, um, we left Noah off. I can't forget about him. So um, Noah's being given another seven days seems to correspond with the seven years of the great tribulation coming upon men after which the saints will be lifted up. I would say the seven years of the tribulation and the first half of the wrath of Elohim. I need to go back and edit my notes here. And then they will be, as Noah was lifted up above the waves, so the saints will be lifted up above all the wrath that's going on on the earth to meet Yeshua in the air. And then afterwards, the wrath of Elohim occurs as the heavens open up, the bowl judgments are poured out like rain upon the earth against unrepentant humanity. In Noah's time, it rained 40 days. 40, Mike, you'll appreciate this, is, is a number of judgment. And Noah and his family were lifted up above the earth, Genesis 7, 17. Again, this is a picture of the, I believe, of the resurrection of the saints after the great tribulation and wrath of Elohim prior to the second half of Yehovah's, um, um, prior to the second half of his wrath. Um, and so people say, well, are you... <clears throat> mid-trib are you pre-trib post-trib i am something that i've never heard anybody say before i am post-trib post great trib mid-wrath uh, pre-second half of the wrath of elohim believer okay now, that's what you call putting a finer point on something, okay? That's what you call um, um, fine-tuning truth, and that's what I am. Unless somebody can show me something else, that's what I see in the Scriptures. Again, I'm open to being wrong about this, but I see the patterns, and I see the Scriptures, and unless I'm totally off on everything, which I don't think I am, I think that that's generally what's going to happen. And in the last 16, 17 years, I haven't had anybody be able to, um, they've never, in fact, nobody's even questioned this interpretation. So I don't know, I mean, either nobody's reading what I write or, or, or nobody, has a, nobody has a disagreement. I don't know, whatever. I know people are reading and watching because I see the stats. Okay, let's talk about the 10 days of awe. In, in conclusion here, let's talk about the 10 days of awe between the day of the blowing of trumpets and the day of, uh, of atonement. So there's 10 days between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, Yom Teruah happens on the first day of the seventh month and Yom Kippur happens 10 days later on the 10th day of the seventh month. So there's uh, uh, 10 days. So according to Jewish tradition, and I'm not going to go into the details, but they believe that this is a period of time when the books are opened and you have, you have the book of life, the book of the dead, and the book of the undecided. Okay, I don't know if I can really see that um, overtly in Scripture, but I can see senses of that. We do know that there is a book of life. We also know that your name can be um, taken out of the book of life. And, and, and that would seem to be, uh, and Paul talks about, or uh, Moses talks about this in uh, Exodus 32, verse 32. And Psalm 69, verse 28 talks about uh, the book of life. And I don't know, I don't remember what Psalm 60, 69, verse 28 says. So, um, let me turn there real fast. Psalm 69, 28. It says here, uh, pardon me, 69, 28. Let them be bought out of the book of life. Let them be bought out of the book of the living. So, your name can be blotted out of the book of living, and if there's a book of the living, there's probably a, the Remez hint of this would be that there's a book of the dead. 
Um, and the Jews, Jews teach this in their traditions. Um, now, if we go to, you know, the book of life is mentioned in Revelation 20, verse 12. That's at the white throne judgment. <clears throat> it says, well, verse 12, verse 12 says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. So we know there's one more than one book. Again, if there's a book of the life, then there's the book of the dead, most likely. And another book was opened. So there was a book and another book was opened. What is this other book? And the dead were judged according to their works. So this other book that was opened, and I think Anna pointed this out, um, and, and it was a revelation to me, but this other book was opened. So you have books, and then you have another book. So presumably there's a book of life, the book of the dead, and another book. There's three books mentioned here. This book would seem to indicate a book of the undecided. These are not the wicked, and these are not the righteous. These are, and as I've taught before, I believe these are people who Paul references in, um, in uh, Revel uh, Romans 2, 12 to 16, who live up to the light of the truth that they were given, but they were not saved, but they're rewarded. And I believe, and, and 1 Peter 4, 6 talks about this, and there's a few other scriptures we've talked about before, but I believe that many people are going to have a second chance to accept Yeshua, who maybe never heard the gospel. Maybe they were stillborn. Maybe they died in their mother's womb. Maybe they were aborted. Maybe they died as an infant, or maybe they died as a, as, you know, before the age of accountability, as a child or a young person. Maybe uh, they lived a good life, but Yah just, you know, good life. I mean, they were still sinners, but they were not wicked. You know, they, 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 they lived up, they didn't steal, they didn't commit adultery, they didn't lie. I mean, they lived up, they tried to live a good, decent life but they never accepted Yeshua. Maybe because they didn't hear, hear the message of the gospel. Maybe they just, it wasn't their time to be called yet. Because remember, it's a calling. We have to be called. And I believe that these people are going to be given a second chance because it says that every knee, everyone will be a, appear before the judgment seat of Elohim and every knee shall bow. And I believe at that moment in time, this third group of people will have a chance to accept Yeshua. Yeah, they will, re they will receive a lower reward, but they will be in his kingdom. Let's read on here in Matthew, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20. And it says here, <clears throat> uh, the sea gave up the dead. Well, they're going to be judged according to what's written in the books. This, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead. I'm, I'm in Revelation 20. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. <coughs> Pardon me. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So what about those people who were written in the book of life? Who accepted Yeshua at that time? What about all the people that were saved during the millennium? I'm not talking about the first resurrection. I'm talking about a second resurrection. A second resurrection to appear before the judgment seat of Elohim. Some will be cast in the lake of fire because they're going to shake their fist at Elohim and they're going to, they don't want any part of it. But then there are going to be people that all of a sudden the light is going to come on and they're going to accept him. And I think they're going to be given a second chance. That's my understanding of this. And um, so... Anyway, we could go on. So I think the Jews have a sense of this, but they don't quite, you know, they obviously don't have the, the book of Revelation. You know, as far as the 10 days of awe, I think there's some elements of truth to it, but it doesn't answer, address all of the issues. And um, so anyway, I could go on. There's more I could talk about on this, but I'm not going to at this point in time. Let me see what else I want to cover before we bring this to a close. Um, I'm scanning through my notes here real quickly. I covered all those things. Oh, let's go to Revelation 14, verse 4. 
So we read about in Revelation 11 about the rewards being given to the saints at the seventh trumpet. And we talked about the rewards being eternal life and glorification and being with Yeshua forever. Now let's read that again real fast. Um, and uh, verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. He's talking about the righteous dead, the resurrection, the first resurrection of Yeshua at his second coming, that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. And then we have here at Revelation 14, verse 4, we have a harvest going on. And he says, verse uh, 14 of Revelation, four, uh, well, actually verse 4 here, let's see. what, And it talks about the 144,000 and those, these are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And they were redeemed among the men being first fruits. These are the first fruits of those redeemed among men. Those are those who are in the first resurrection. Why would the Bible say first fruits if there aren't second fruits, more fruit to follow? It would be pointless. It's like saying hot, but there's no cold, up and there's no down, good and there's no bad. No, if there's first fruits, then there must be others yet to come. And I believe that the white throne judgment, to the best of my understanding, is an explanation of the second fruits to get saved at that time while the rest go into the lake of fire. Okay? All right. What else? Um... Yeah, I, oh, and I, we'll, we'll probably cover this when we get to Yom Teruah, but let me just, I mentioned this yesterday in the, in the teaching, but I'm going to, for the sake of this discussion and this teaching, so I believe that, that the scriptures teach that the righteous dead will be resurrected at the seventh trumpet on Yom Teruah to meet Yeshua in the air, they will then go, in. this will be the first heaven of the earth's atmosphere, and then they will go to the third heaven where Yah dwells. There he will show them their mansion, the new Jerusalem. Why? Why do I think that? Well, because if we go to Revelation 19, verse 1, I mentioned this yesterday, Revelation 19, verse 1, After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. The great multitude is probably the resurrected saints and the rest of the folks that are up there, the spirit beings. And they're in heaven. It doesn't say which heaven. The Bible talks about three heavens. But I think this is the third heaven. <clears throat> saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory to, and honor to, and power belong to Yehovah our Elohim. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the earth and the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He's judged her. He hasn't destroyed her yet. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants is shed by her. So they've already been resurrected. That happened at the seventh trumpet. Again, they say, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever. And the 24 hours elders, and they, 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 you know, they're worshiping and praising. And then, and then we read the famous verses. Let us be glad and rejoice, verse 7. Give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. It, it is coming. It hasn't happened yet. That happens at Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, at the resurrection, the bride goes out to meet her bridegroom. Then he takes her to the, her father's house. In ancient Israel, 
the bride, a bride would would go to um, go to live on the father's her uh, her bride's bridegroom's father's estate. The woman would become part of that tribe. Okay, so but earth, the New Jerusalem is coming to this earth. That's the mansion. That's the holy of holies. That's where that's coming back to. I believe coming back to this earth with Yeshua. That's where they're going to be living. And I talked about that yesterday. It's going to be a spiritual dimension that's going to be maybe visible to the human eye, maybe not. But anyway, Yeshua's going to come back. He's going to live there. The saints are going to be coming and going from that. That's a picture of Jacob's ladder. <clears throat> and it that's when they're going to be married. The marriage is going to be finalized during the Feast of Tabernacles, the wedding feast of the Lamb. And... And, and that's going to be a whole, you know, that's a whole nother scenario. And blessed, verse 9, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not everybody's going to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we see verse 11. <clears throat> now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So here in the third heaven, Yeshua is on a white horse. He's coming back with this great cloud, multitude from heaven. Verse that we read about in verse 1. And he's coming back to make war. Guys, this is Armageddon. I believe there's, they're going to think it's an alien invasion. What would you think if you suddenly saw this big thing like the New Jerusalem? is 1,200 square miles coming and then you saw all these people in robes and on horses you'd think it was an, an, you know supernaturally coming at you if you were the people of this earth you'd be gathering your missiles and your rockets and your tanks and your guns and everything and you'd be all coming together like the battle of armageddon talks about and you'd probably be thinking it was an alien invasion and you'd be fighting it it says his eyes were like a flame of fire, verse 12, and his, on his head were many crowns. He's the king of kings. And he should strike the nations. A, verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged two -edged sword. The word, his word, he's going to judge them on what they have done and not done. I think this is the sheep and the goats judgments. He's going to judge the wicked nations. That's the sheep and goat judgments of uh, the end of Matthew chapter 25 and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he, sh he himself will tread the winepress of the fierceness fierceness of the wrath of almighty and if we go back to Revel um, revelation 18 he talks about babylon the great is fallen is fallen and he talks about all the attributes of babylon the great and it says it, it, it falls in one day gone Yeshua's going to come back and destroy the whole thing. And if we go back here to chapter 14, we're back to the bowl judgments. So I believe this is the, the, the period of time uh, between Yom, Teru uh, Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. And that five days in between Yom Kippur and, uh, and, and Sukkot where he's going to pour out his bull judgments and he's going to then come back and finalize his judgment on the earth and destroy Babylon the Great. And then after that, Satan's going to be cast in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Now, what are the saints going to be doing? Well, let me just say this. Verse uh, Revelation 14, 17. Um, then in another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. So the Bible speaks in agricultural terms. So the saints are going to be harvested and gathered into Yovah's barn uh, and, and for protection, just like Noah went into the ark for protection against the wrath of Elohim on the, on the world of that day. And, and But there's going to be a harvest of the wicked, Verse 18, Revelation 14. And another 
angel came out from the altar who had, you know, from heaven and had a power over fire. And he cried with a loud uh, cry to him who had the sharp sickle saying, thrust your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of wine of the earth and her grapes are fully ripe. Literally means rotten. They're rotten. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and, the, and gathered the wine of the earth, the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of Elohim. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. A lot of blood is going to be spilled. I think this may be speaking about Armageddon. Um, anyway, or that whole time period, whatever. I don't know all the details. So um, that is what I see. So during when, when the saints go up to uh, meet Yeshua in the air, they're going to meet each other face-to-face, one-on-one. And like I said yesterday, there's going to be great rejoicing. Great rejoicing. I mean, finally, the saints who have been waiting for thousands of years get to see Yeshua. Finally, the hope has come, the realization of their hope and their faith, what they died for, what they sacrificed for, what they put up life on this earth for. Now here he is. And it's going to be a time of great joy. At the same time, now that they're gone, he can pour out his wrath and his upon the rest of the earth because his saints have been gathered and he's going to bring judgment. So the saints will be watching from the, if you will, the grand stands of heaven, the wrath of Elohim being poured out. But I, I suspect that the saints will be so busy worshiping Elohim and being in his presence and trying out their new glorified bodies that they won't be thinking about that. Um, so that's what I see. And then they will come back with him, the glorified bride of Yeshua. Then he will put his feet up, destroy those that have opposed him, the spirit of Antichrist and the, all the armies and nations of the world that have come against him. And then the, that's when the Jews in Israel, those that survive that time, will look upon him whom they pierced. As he here says here in Zechariah, what is it, 10 or 12? And, um, and he, they, they, will, um, they will look upon him yeah, verse uh, 12. And I will pour on the house of David, verse 10, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look upon me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for, for one as grieves for the firstborn. In that day, there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo, which I think this may be a reference to the battle of Armageddon. And then verse 14 it talks about him putting his feet on the Mount of Olives after the battle of Armageddon. Verse 14, Behold, the day of Yehovah is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. Verse 2, For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravaged or raped. Half the city shall go into captivity or exile, and the remnant of the people shall not be cut off. I don't know all the timing of all this. I don't know how this all happens. Then Yovah will go forth and fight against those nations. And he, and he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east and so forth and so on. So I believe that that's on the day of atonement when Yeshua actually puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. Dear brothers and sisters, that's my best understanding. I may... I have a lot more to learn on these things, but that's what I have learned up to this point. I may have some of these details wrong. I may be off on a few things, but that's my best understanding in the last 16 years that I've been teaching this. My videos have been out there. So far, nobody has shown me to be wrong. Uh, I'm adding more information and understanding, but the overall blueprint or template based on, as we talked about yesterday, the layout of the, the, the Tabernacle of Moses, the, the, the um, a template of the biblical feasts based on uh, also the biblical wedding. Uh, 
which we talk, talked about, as well as what I see in Matthew 24 and the chronology of the book of Revelation. That's what I see. I hope this blessed somebody. And if, if, uh, if you don't like it, don't throw stones at me. <laughs> Love me anyway. All right. Blessings to you all. Shalom. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good.